tells a story over 2,000 years old about the birth of China's first imperial dynasty. It was a time of conflict, a time of betrayal, and the lust for power. It has all the makings of a great novel, really. It's got intrigue, it's got violence, sex, mystery. At its center is Qin Shi Huang, the emperor who created a superpower out of warring factions, a controversial figure historians viewed with scorn. They portray him as irrational, deeply superstitious, incompetent, a tyrant. But is this depiction of Qin Shi Huang fact or fiction? What we know comes from the account by Sima Qian, who was actually writing during the historical period following the Qin Dynasty. Was he an incompetent ruler, a brutal tyrant, or a great leader? Now it's time to take another look at China's first emperor. BC. In Far East Asia, war had been raging for nearly two centuries. The collapse of a 500-year-old dynasty had unleashed a ruthless power struggle between seven rival states, each one vying for dominance, each bent on conquest. What once was the Zhou Empire had fractured into pieces the battlefield was where disputes were resolved. <laughs> Playing out the ambitions of their leaders, thousands of warriors engaged in a ritual of combat, wielding swords and facing their destiny. remained to be seen which of the warring states would emerge victorious and become the new power in the region. During the chaos in Xianyang, the capital of Qin State, on the western border of the crumbling dynasty, a new king was crowned. His ascension to the throne was unexpected and to some within the kingdom represented an opportunity. This new king was 13 years old, ill-equipped for the responsibilities of being a monarch. He inherited a palace rife with intrigue, deception, and duplicity. Few believed he could guarantee his own safety, let alone control the fate of his kingdom. But this seemingly unremarkable heir would do what no ruler had done before make one nation from the remnants of a broken empire. His name was Ying Zheng, later to be called Qin Shi Huang. But there's little we know of him. The primary source for Qin Shi Huang's life is this Han Dynasty text called Records of the Grand Historian, written by Sima Qian. Written, as it turns out, more than a century after Qin Shi Huang died, and it really is a magnificent text. It's, it's very compelling, it's full of detail and dialogue, and it has all the makings of, uh, of a great novel, really. But is that text accurate? According to Sima Qian, living with the young ruler was Zhang's widowed mother, Queen Dowager Zhao. She was the only person the young boy king could trust. Or so it seemed. What he didn't know was beneath his mother's serene gaze, there lurked a dark motive. She installed a palace minister to act as his advisor, an influential ally who would allow the queen access to her son's royal power. His name was Lu Bu Wei, the man who had introduced the queen 
when she was a lowly concubine to the previous king. So when the young king first ascended the throne, he was just a teenager. And it would have been common practice at that time to have appointed a regent uh, for rulers who had not yet come of age. As regent and advisor to Ying Zhang, Liu Bowei was the most influential man in the palace, the power behind the throne, who would rule the kingdom from the shadows. But he had a secret of his own to hide. He was Queen Zhao's lover and the likely father of the young king. To conceal his relationship with the queen, Liu Bowei looked for a man who could replace him in the queen's bedroom, a man he could trust and his queen would accept. Liu Bowei found a well-endowed man and uh, paraded him about so that uh, Ying Zheng's mother's uh, lasciviousness would be aroused. Lu Bui's scheme worked at first. Lao Ai disguised himself as a eunuch so he could enter the queen's chamber without suspicion and ultimately capture her heart. The queen was a willing accomplice in Lu Bui's plan. Away from prying eyes, she and Lao Ai began a torrid affair that fueled a plot to overthrow her son, the king. Trails coming from within the palace were perils young Zhang had to anticipate. He may have possessed a king's power, but being a teenager, he was too inexperienced to use it effectively. As a result, he had to rely on Lu Bui's advice, which may not have always been in his best interests. Despite the constant state of war in the region, Ying Zhang had inherited a kingdom that was steadily growing. There were talented generals, there were wise ministers already in place, and Lu Buwei was among them. So while Ying Zheng was a teenager, the Qin state continued to grow and consolidate land and uh, become more and more powerful. But the end to centuries of war was still off in the future. Rival states were consumed in battling each other for survival and for supremacy. It would take a bold leader with fearless vision to rise above the fray and seize victory from his enemies. Eight years later, 238 BC. The affair between the queen and her lover had flourished. Lao Ai no longer pretended to be a servile eunuch. With the queen's support, he was now a powerful man, and the pair secretly had two sons together. But Lao Ai wanted more than lavish palace comforts. He had his sights set on a bigger prize. But Lao Ai underestimated the now 22-year-old king. Ying Zhang got word of the planned coup. Lu Bui's matchmaking was about to backfire, leaving him exposed to the wrath of an outraged king. When his plot to overthrow King Ying Zhang was discovered, Lao Ai decided to make his move. 
Without the element of surprise, he and his followers rode toward the palace, intent on making a preemptive strike. But the king was no longer a naive teenager. He had learned from his palace ministers and military advisors and had carefully planned a response. The king saw his chance to eliminate both Lao Ai, who was after his throne, and Lu Bue, his scheming, too powerful regent. Ying Zhang anticipated that Lao Ai would try to storm the palace by entering the front gate. He set a trap, and Lao Ai and the rebels fell into it. Lao Ai could only wonder who had orchestrated the attack. Then he spotted Lu Bue, the man responsible for his rise in the palace. The co-conspirators were now mortal enemies. Lao Ai was in the palace, and Lao Ai was able to get a bigger and bigger gift. Lao Ai was in the Qin political life, and he was getting higher and higher and higher. His foot was even higher than Lu Bue's foot. 吕不韦深刻地感受到来自嫪毐对他的这种压力，如果不处死嫪毐，吕不韦可能的下场也很悲惨。所以在这么一个情况下，他和秦王联手，一举就把嫪毐的灭掉。灭嫪毐的目的是为了保护自己。To fail in a palace coup is to invite the most severe punishment. Lao Ai, the queen's lover, paid a terrible price. For daring to plot against the king, Lao Ai and three thousand of his men were executed or exiled by Ying Zhang. But Ying Zhang didn't stop there. He had the sons of Lao Ai and his mother killed to keep them from one day seeking revenge against him. In a gesture of mercy, Ying Zhang spared his mother, but placed her under house arrest. Now he had one last conspirator to deal with: Lu Bue, his advisor and the mastermind of the match between Lao Ai and the Queen. Would have to pay for his betrayal. 紧接着，开始处理吕不韦，最后把吕不韦、吕不韦在从洛阳迁到四川的路上，然后赐他为毒酒，把他毒死了。这是秦始皇第一次开始执正式执掌国家政权的时候所显示出来他超人的一面，使得所有人对这个二十二岁的青年的王者再也不敢小视了。It was a turning point in the growth of the young ruler. The moment when Ying Zheng becomes uh, the king of Qin and this powerful man uh, is the moment at which Lu Bu Wei uh, decides to drink poison and, and kill himself, uh, realizing that he had angered what had now become the world's most powerful man. Ying Zheng went on to unveil an ambitious plan to unify the seven warring states into one. He began to appoint men of ability, guest officers, regardless of their background and origin. One of the first was Li Su. Originally from the Chu State, Li Su had a superb legal mind, and would later draw up the ruling ideology of the Qin Empire. Here we have an example of the first emperor allowing someone who came from an enemy state to serve him in a close position because he recognized that Li Su was someone who could be of use. Ying Zhang promoted another talented foreigner, Zhang Guo, a hydraulic engineer from the nearby Han state. In this case, what the first emperor wished 
to have Zheng Guo build for him was a canal that could be used to transform the area, the plain around the capital of Qin into uh, a fertile area. However, the canal project hit a snag from the very start. Ying Zhang learned that Zheng Guo, whom he trusted, was actually a spy from the Han state, sent to divert Qin's resources to wasteful projects. The king's most powerful advisors urged him to expel all foreign officers from the state. But then Li Se from the Chu state weighed in. He risked expulsion by writing a petition, arguing that foreigners like himself were needed if Ying Zhang was to achieve his dream of unifying the states. Lisa's petition was persuasive. Instead of expelling Zhang Guo, the king ordered him to continue building the canal. Ying Zhang's decision to welcome foreigners would alter the course of Chinese history. The canal that Zhang Gua completed made the Guangzhou Plain into fertile land. And as agricultural production increased, the Qin Kingdom grew richer than other states. With his treasury overflowing, Ying Zhang was determined to make his dream of uniting the warring states a reality. He reportedly recruited a million men to become soldiers, supplying them with the latest weapons and training them in the art of war. The result was a formidable fighting machine. It would take time, but Ying Zhang's warriors were ready to mobilize. A million men stood poised to sacrifice their lives to fight their enemies on the battlefield and build Ying Zhang's mighty empire. In 230 BC, the 29-year-old King of Qin embarked on an epic campaign of conquest. He wanted to create an empire out of the pieces of the crumbling Zhou dynasty. And now he had the army to do it. The King's forces numbered over a million men had a vast arsenal of weapons and knew only one battle strategy, to attack. The first target in Ying Zhang's plan was the neighboring state of Han to the east. In the past, the states of the Zhou dynasty created a series of alliances and coalitions to protect themselves against the threat of a powerful enemy. It worked for a while, but things were different this time. Diplomacy proved useless against the Qin war machine. In little time, the Han state fell. Then, Ying Zhang set his sights on another neighbor, Zhao State. Blood flowed freely on the battlefield. Two years into the war, diplomats from Yan arrived in Qin. Their declared purpose was to make amends with the Qin state 
and negotiate a peace. As proof, the Yan envoys came bearing gifts for Ying Zhang. The envoy, Jing Ke, brought a box containing the severed head of a Qin general, who years earlier had fled to Yan after betraying the Qin state. Jing Ke also brought a map of the Yan lands to be presented to the ruler as a gesture signifying the peaceful surrender of the state. But hidden within the map was a surprise. While Ying Zhang avoided the poison dagger, he was on his own against the assassin. The king's ministers are not able to come to his aid because uh, there's a law that says they must ask permission to move about the throne room, and they're not allowed to carry weapons either. Ying Zhang eluded Jing Ke. Then, sword in hand, he killed him. Despite escaping unharmed, the assassination attempt infuriated the king. Enraged, he ordered his army to retaliate by speeding up the war against his adversaries. The slaughter began. The neighboring states were no match for Qin's massive army of skillfully trained soldiers. Ten years passed. One by one, the Qin armies conquered the six neighboring states that battled for the past 200 years. Ying Zhang's dream of creating an empire became a reality. People had thought about an empire that occupied, in effect, the whole world. But it was Ying Zheng who actually created it. And by doing so, he created an ideal that would remain important for the remainder of Chinese history up until the present day. 221 BC. A massive crowd gathered for a coronation ceremony in the capital of Qin where, at 38 years old, Ying Zhang named himself Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of a vast new territory, a territory we now know as China. The title of emperor meant that there was now one and only one sovereign, a declaration that the entire country was under his rule. This was the birth of China, a land of warring states that was now one nation. It was the dawn of a new era. Yingsheng's assumption of the title, the August First Emperor of Qin, or Qin Shi Huang, is crucial because it suggests to us that he no longer saw himself merely as a terrestrial king, but rather he saw his role as being elevated to that of the ruler of an empire, um, and a role that could be viewed perhaps on cosmic proportions. But as emperor, Qin Shi Huang still faced many challenges. Among them was the need to bring together people from different states and cultures under a single system to consolidate his realm. It's pretty clear that he recognized that what he was doing had never been done before. It was important to him that people not think of themselves as loyal to former kingdoms, but rather loyal to the Qin Empire. Unification began with a change in the system of government. Qin Shi Huang abolished feudalism, dividing the empire into 36 prefectures, or provinces, which were placed under his direct control. This centralization of power was unprecedented. Officials were appointed to positions on the basis of merit and ability, 
rather than on hereditary rights or family ties. This system, known as legalism, represented a break from previous traditions. The early legalists viewed humans as essentially selfish, but not necessarily in a bad way. Uh, they thought that the state could harness this selfishness and allow their subjects to pursue their desires and passions in the service of the state. Qin Shi Huang had to overcome fierce opposition from powerful ministers for his reformations to succeed. To do so, he relied on Li Se, who served as his prime minister and wrote many of Qin's new laws. Qin didn't emphasize ritual and tradition, but instead they emphasized law and the importance of law codes, of something that didn't vary or change according to family or according to local place. This is something introduced by the Qin. In 1975, archaeologists got a first-hand look at Qin's legal system when over a thousand bamboo slips were found in a small village in Hunan province. Analysis revealed that the laws were written during Qin Shi Huang's reign. The bamboo slips demonstrate how extensive and strict the laws were at the time. They regulated people's lives closely and harsh punishments were meted out to violators. also other changes in store for the empire. Li Se standardized weights and measurements. Units of volume, length, and weight were made uniform to simplify trade and tax collection. Qin Shi Huang continued his standardization policy throughout the empire. This is the Ban Liang coin of the Qin. At the time, different regions of the country used different types of currency. Qin Shi Huang unified the currency with Ban Liang coins, making buying and selling easier throughout China. But that wasn't the last of the emperor's changes. Among the reforms that Qin Shi Huang introduced to unify China, one stood as the most challenging. Each state in the newly created empire had its own form of writing, which made communication between them difficult. This was the biggest stumbling block to enforcing Qin's new laws and policies. It was important to unify the writing system as quickly as possible. The emperor sent scholars to each province to teach the Qin script. Since writing systems express thought and culture, Qin Shi Huang knew that without a unified script, his empire could dissolve into chaos. Posing a universal written language made for better communication and acceptance of policies. These characters mean horse in the varying scripts of each state. Qin Shi Huang unified them with the Qin script. The significance of introducing a standardized system of writing cannot be overstated because it facilitated greatly the new system bureaucracy that was introduced under Qin Shi Huang. Many of the standardized Chinese characters established during the Qin dynasty have survived to the present day. Qin Shi Huang had achieved what many had dreamed, but no one had done before, uniting the warring states into a single nation. He created a new society based not on custom and tradition, but on a powerful central government and the rule of law. Yet despite this achievement, Qin Shi Huang has been portrayed throughout 2,000 years of history 
as a cruel and brutal tyrant. Some ancient records claim the emperor ordered the burning of books that he believed criticized his rule or undermined his power. He was also said to have decreed that dissident scholars be buried alive. The reasons for book burning, essentially suppressing freedom of thought and speech, were political. The emperor was concerned about the spread of ideas opposing his reformation policies and challenging the legitimacy of his rule. Yet historians today question whether wholesale book burnings actually occurred. We doubt very much that if the burning of the books ever happened, that it really represented a burning of all of literature. I think we should, if it happened, we should take it as an example of a government wanting to control information, wanting to define what is right and what is wrong, to create a kind of orthodoxy. And I think there's nothing especially unique in that. Every country, every civilization wants to be able to tell its story the way they want to tell it. According to the historical accounts, the Qin Dynasty did not destroy all books. Some copies of forbidden texts were preserved in the emperor's imperial archives. Writings on medicine, farming, technology, and astronomy were known to be kept in the palace. It's evidence that Qin Shi Huang did value practical knowledge. But more disturbing than book burnings are accounts of the emperor's brutality, designed to enforce obedience through intimidation. According to the records of historians writing after the fall of the Qin Dynasty, Qin Shi Huang ordered that 460 Confucian scholars who owned copies of forbidden books were to be buried alive. But these accounts were written over a century after the burials were to have occurred, which leads historians to doubt their validity. And since in Chinese history, there's a long-standing practice of dynastic histories being written by um, the successor dynasties, the view that is presented of Qin Shi Huang by Sima Qian, who was actually writing during the historical period following the Qin Dynasty, uh, presents a ruler um, who was a tyrant. Whenever people talked about bad rulers, bad kings in the past, one of the things they would say about a bad ruler or a bad king was that this was a person who had no respect for scholars and buried them or, or burned documents. And so, in effect, what, what we're told about the first emperor is just part of a tradition of criticizing rulers that you don't like. And so, in my view, I don't think we can give very much historical weight to those claims made against the first emperor. Rather than being a cruel tyrant, it's likely that Qin Shi Huang was a target of political propaganda created by the Han Dynasty that succeeded his. Its purpose was to discredit the Qin Dynasty and by doing so, justify and elevate its own existence. All of our sources for Qing Dynasty history come from the subsequent dynasty, the Han Dynasty. And so we always have to sort of take them with a grain of salt, considering that they consistently portray Qin Dynasty ministers and Qin Shi Huang himself as somewhat tyrannical, somewhat opportunistic, and ultimately a failure. Many of today's scholars see Qin Shi Huang in a different light. Uh, 
腐敗はしちゃいけないそれに対して非常に厳しいわけですいろんな法律で官僚たちを統制しますそういう政治を考えてみるとあの一般に言われていたような始皇帝が暴君であるという考え方は見直していく必要があるかと思います By virtue of his military and political prowess Qin Shi Huang ended centuries of conflict and brought peace to the constantly warring states. During his 12-year reign, he journeyed throughout his realm in the company of his army to inspect the nation he had built. But he also had a personal reason for undertaking these tours. He wanted to live as long as possible. He wanted to prolong his lifetime. And so one of the reasons for making these uh, uh, expeditions around his empire was to look for the secrets of immortality that would enable the first emperor to extend his lifetime and extend his reign so that he could continue uh, to rule over his empire. As he traveled through his empire, Qin Shi Huang had stone monuments called stele erected to commemorate his tours. Engraved on them are his decrees, achievements, and exploits, the only written records from the time. But even after forming a mighty superpower, Qin Shi Huang's realm was not free from outside threats. It led him to undertake one of the ancient world's most extensive construction projects to defend his nation. The Great Wall of China, erected as a defensive perimeter against enemies attacking from the north, has become Qin Shi Huang's most visible legacy. Today, it draws some 10 million visitors a year. Portions of the wall had already existed, built by rulers of the states Qin Shi Huang had conquered. The emperor's plan was to connect those walls with newly built barricades, a project involving as many as a million of his subjects working over many years. And so he set about consolidating these pre-existing walls of other kingdoms. They weren't the brick and stone wall we know now that was primarily a project of the Ming dynasty. The Qin dynasty wall was tamped earth, uh, essentially setting up uh, wooden frameworks and tamping earth between them uh, and then raising the frame to the desired height. Once completed, the Great Wall formed a vast structure running over 5,000 miles a monument to Qin Shi Huang's vision of a great Chinese empire. His final great construction project was creating a national network of roads. 2,000 years later, these magnificent roads testify to the splendor of the Qin dynasty. The emperor probably traveled along this roadway on his inspection tours. The empire that Qin Shi Huang created was centered around the Yellow River and stretched from the Great Wall in the north to the borders of Vietnam in the south. His accomplishments are staggering. In just over two decades of rule, Qin Shi Huang laid the foundation of China that would last for the next 2,000 years. Once a vulnerable 13-year-old king controlled by others, Ying Zhang survived treachery in the palace, outwitted his enemies, and became a powerful leader. After a decade-long war, he unified China and built an empire. Despite a reputation that portrayed him as a tyrant, Qin Shi Huang has emerged as a ruler who transformed the world he was born into.
，在他的统治上也采取了一些过激的措施，特别是在大兴头目上滥用民力，这实际上等于加速了秦的灭亡。但是，他整个的一生应该说对中国历史发展的贡献应该是主要的，并不像。史书上说的还是暴君。Two ten BC, twelve years after China was unified, Qin Shi Huang was on another quest, this time for immortality. Now fifty years old, the emperor was exhausted from overwork and weakened from ingesting mercury pills, which he believed would make him immortal. A hot summer day, during a tour of eastern China, the emperor died. Not in his royal palace, but in his carriage. The exact cause of death was never revealed, though it's thought mercury poisoning likely played a part in his demise. The emperor's body was returned to the Qin capital, and then laid to rest in his mausoleum under the man-made mountain. In nearby Xianyang, the funeral procession entered a tomb that was the stuff of wonder. A lavish, divinely inspired replica of his empire awaited him underground, a world he believed he would rule in the afterlife for eternity. Records from historian Sima Qian. Claim that it took 700,000 workers 38 years to build the mausoleum. Joining him in the afterlife were many priceless treasures, including rare birds and animals, as well as his childless wives, all sealed with Qin Shi Huang in his burial chamber. A ruler who dreamed of immortality, he also had an army of terracotta warriors. Buried nearby to protect him in the afterlife and enhance his legacy. Is, 古人说的，中国两千年之争，秦政也，就是实际上秦始皇他实行的诸多的制度，呃，也很多都延续到现在。没有秦始皇，中国历史就不完整。他是中国历史上唯一不可缺少的人物。Just four years after Qin Shi Huang died, the dynasty he established collapsed. But the nation he created lived on, and still exists today. China is a country of 1.4 billion people, comprising 55 different ethnic groups who speak 120 different languages. Home to this rich diversity. For the past 2,000 years, it's remained one nation. We should keep in mind that the boundaries of empire、uh, that Ying Zheng created are more or less the boundaries of modern-day China. China now enjoys the greatest economic prosperity in its history. Scholars tell us the essential principles and beliefs of Qin Shi Huang. Are still woven into the fabric of the nation. I think it's safe to say that perhaps the most important legacy of Qin Shi Huang is the idea of empire itself. <laughs>